Saren Kierkegaard, Various Readings From Punitive Righteousness, Christian Ethics, Second Part, Second Division, Social Ethics By Hans Martinson, published in 1899, pages 135 to 137 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Punitive Righteousness For the infliction of punishment it is necessary that the man come to recognize it as a deserved punishment, that is, that he acknowledge his sin and likewise reckon it to him as his guilt. Sooner or later this acknowledgment of sin and guilt, that is, not only of this or that sin and guilt, but of the whole sinful guilty state, will come for every man, be it in this life, at the hour of death, or in the future life. When such a moment occurs, the man stands face to face with a great alternative. This knowledge, in which each one who has not been reconciled to his God will necessarily feel himself unworthy of communion with God, must either lead to repentance, to godly sorrow, in which he then lays hold of grace, in faith in the forgiveness of sins, or it must pass into despair, into an absolute renunciation of all hope, desperation. Despair is the last result of sin, except an escape from this hell can be gained by means of repentance. Despair is the essence and the proper meaning of hell, wherefore the inferno in Dante bears that inscription, All hope abandon, ye who enter here. That sin is not repented of must lead to despair, is evident in those men who have made greater progress in the path of sin. The farther a man proceeds in this path, the more a secret despair moves within him. Note 1. In Søren Kierkegaard's paradoxical utterance in his book The Sickness Unto Death, that all men are in a state of despair, even though they do not know it themselves, we can only acknowledge the general truth, that in every human heart, in consequence of the state of sin, there exists a germ of despair. But it may also, with as good reason, be said, that in every human heart a germ of hope is present, and that man's hope, his hope, however indefinite, of salvation is only fully extinguished in the extreme stages of sin and guilt. The conception of despair can, as we apprehend, only be set forth with the definiteness belonging to it, when it is fully defined in its relation to the conceptions of hope and futurity. End of note. However many false prospects and hopes the guilt-laden one may conjure up, there yet lies at the bottom of his soul a secret hopelessness, not merely regarding the event of his special egoistic efforts, but above all a hopelessness in regard of his own person, his future. Despite all his lies and all his defiance, yet the power of God, the power of good, so asserts itself for him that he fears the truth and reality of it that he, this presupposed, feels himself overcome, rejected and excluded from the communion of God, and only staring into a starless night. In secret we say, this despair is present, but if the moment occurs when the consciousness of guilt emerges in full clearness, it becomes manifested. In despair the sinner may yet, with the abyss of hopelessness and darkness before his eyes, abide in his defiance, in order to perish with heroism. But the history of sin shows us that even to the most defiant and arrogant sinners there yet come moments when they sink down, feel a deep horror of themselves, despond and despair. And it may perhaps be said that in hell there occurs a constant alternation, an incessant change of despair, now into defiance, now into despondency, in single instances both together. Compare Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The desponding hopelessness in which the sinner loses courage, becomes cowardly, and breaks down, must not, as one is often inclined to do, be confounded with repentance or godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 Not with a feeling of repentance, which ever includes a hope, however anxious and a longing, but in boundless despair, in horror of himself. Judas declares, I have betrayed innocent blood, and cast from him the thirty pieces of silver. That it is no godly sorrow is clearly proved by his suicide that follows. 
and to take an example from another sphere not in repentance but in despair king richard the third speaks while his fate is overtaking him and after he had dreamed his darker dreams of conscience which have made his heart despondent my conscience hath a thousand several tongues and every tongue brings in a several tale and every tale condemns me for a villain perjury perjury in the highest degree murder stern murder in the durst degree all several sins all used in each degree throng to the bar crying all guilty guilty i shall despair there is no creature loves me and if i die no soul shall pity me nay wherefore should they since that i myself find in myself no pity to myself shakespeare's richard the third act five scene three such sinners cannot believe in the article of forgiveness of sins we see too how soon after his outburst of his despondency and despair he calls himself again to defiance let not our babbling dreams affright our souls conscience is but a word that cowards use devised at first to keep the strong in awe and in the last words that we hear from him on the battleground ere he vanishes from our eyes a horse a horse my kingdom for a horse we hear both the terrific anguish of despair the terror of death in more than a mere bodily sense and also the demoniac 